This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show for May 21st, 2019, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? Christina Roach. Hey, everyone. And producer Pat. Hi, checkers. We have a great show for you today. Christina is going to explore whether science can prove rap is the most important music since 1960. And then Adam is going to look into energy costs versus waste. Mm -hmm. But first, I'm going to explore the presidential war on the press. The following few paragraphs are quoted material from a news article I read recently. The U.S. Justice Department secretly obtained two months of telephone records of reporters and editors for the Associated Press in what the news cooperative's top executive called a massive and unprecedented intrusion into how news organizations gather the news. Continuing, Uh the records obtained by the Justice Department listed incoming and outgoing calls and the duration of each call for the work and personal phone numbers of individual reporters, general AP office numbers in New York, Washington, and Hartford, Connecticut, and the main number for AP reporters in the House of Representatives press gallery, according to attorneys for the AP. In all, the government sees those records for more than 20 separate telephone lines assigned to AP. The exact number of journalists who use the phone lines during that period is unknown, but more than 100 journalists work in the offices whose phone records were targeted on a wide array of stories about government and other matters. Wow. Wow. I wanted to ask the panel, who had heard about this? I had not heard about this. I, I saw your segment title and I didn't know it was going to be about this. Yeah, definitely news here as well. Yes, it was news to me. Wow. Even though it was published in May, uh, May 2013. Oh, oh, wow. The Obama administration did this because they thought an AP story might have harmed national security. The previous year to that, the AP was told by a tipster that the CIA had thwarted a Yemen-based plot to bomb an airliner and the anniversary of killing Osama bin Laden. And the United States used that as an excuse to do this. Okay. Michael Enright, and this is linked in our notes at trcpodcast.com. It's a great website. Provides some more examples from the Obama administration. The Obama Justice Department spent seven years in court trying to get New York Times reporter James Risen to reveal his sources. The Obama White House went after a Fox News reporter who was trying to get information about North Korea's nuclear arsenal, where the attorneys called the reporter a conspirator against the United States. Wow. As well, the Obama White House has the worst record in history of fulfilling freedom of information requests. And from CBC's Neil McDonald, quote, Obama's officials have prosecuted more than twice as many leakers, six, as all previous administrations combined. But it's important to note that some of those began under Bush. Why does any of this matter? Well, it links to other segments I have done recently about trying to understand what media filters or bubbles you may be in. I frequently see phrases like Trump's unprecedented war on the press. But is it actually unprecedented? Well, it depends what you mean. Trump seems to personally attack people, including reporters, more than other presidents. So that's new or new-ish. But has he done new things attacking the freedom of the press? Of course, I understand that Trump hasn't finished his first term, and it is possible that if he gets reelected, then he would do worse things than one I've listed above. Oh. One can't fairly compare two to three years with eight, but Obama's name almost never comes up as a comparator. No. Obama didn't tweet and say preposterous things. In fact, aside from, you know, uh, his pauses, he often spoke quite well and rarely said inflammatory things. But that doesn't mean he wasn't also deceptive and manipulative like all presidents are. Hmm. Enright quotes David Zerowick in the Baltimore Sun. In fairness to Trump, his administration has not escalated the conflict with the press to a new level. It has not yet come close to doing what President Obama's administration did in making the act of reporting itself criminal behavior. Wow. I can't fully evaluate these claims, but I did want to put the thought in your mind that perhaps Trump isn't worse than Obama after all in his war on the press. I guess a factor to consider, uh, not to defend Obama, but a factor to consider is what is the reason behind the prosecution of press in a certain case? Uh, it sounds like in Obama's case, it was uh, national security driven, not to excuse it. It sounds like in Trump's case, it's I don't like what you're saying about me, Drew. So That's a to good add a, point. a little bit more context, uh, the AP had this story. They chose not to release it because their sources said this may cause a security incident. Uh-huh. And then the U.S. government said they were going to release the story. And then the AP was like, well, okay, I guess then we could just release it. Yeah. So it seems like a pretty flimsy excuse to do what they did. Uh-huh. And that's why it seems legitimate. That's why I use it as an example. Yeah. I think people don't quite realize how terrible 
almost all presidents are in certain ways. <laughs> it's politics. It's like, oh, Trump's terrible. Like, who bombed, you know, weddings in Pakistan? That was Obama, you know? And you could say, well, because of this, because of that, the cost, the benefits of this and that. But let's not forget these things happened. Yeah. I feel like if we were any other people... <laughs> We may have responded by going, oh, yeah, I heard that on the news yesterday, and Trump's a jerk. <laughs> Seriously. You know, just like the Jimmy Kimmel live eye on the street or whatever it's called. Yes. Yes. Well, and even, uh, we can share some behind the scenes. I mentioned I was going to do this. Adam temporarily titled my segment Trump's War on the Press, even though I didn't use Trump's oh, name. I yeah. changed it back. Yeah. But that's just the assumption. Of course, right? And you yes. Google, like, unprecedented. It's unprecedented all over the place. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. Yes. Yeah. So is your takeaway that they're both terrible or is your takeaway that being the president of the United States is a really difficult job? In some cases, you have to do some horrible things. It is a difficult job. In some cases, you do have to do probably some horrible things. It's not clear you had to do these horrible things in those jobs. It's like that line, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. Well, if you want the freedom to have reasonable, coherent thoughts and understand the world, you have to be ever vigilant of all the media that comes into you, even though it seems to align with everything else that you understand about the world. Trump does seem to be doing things that are unprecedented against the press. Now, it is possible, yes, Trump is doing unprecedented things, and Obama also did <laughs> unprecedented things. They're just yes. different things. Yes. And then you could compare which one's worse than others. But no one even brings up Obama when yeah. they're criticizing Trump's so-called war on the press. And and, and, you know, there can be a case that you can make a case for, you know, freedom of the press, I think, is important. You can probably make an ethical case for many reasons uh, for which, uh, you know, in this case, maybe freedom of the, of the press um, is bad for uh, X, Y people or the outcome could be better if there was less of it. But you kind of have to stand by that principle sort of broadly, broadly. speaking. Um, to highlight my own point by catching myself, I said you never see the comparison to Obama. You probably do. I just don't get exposed yes. to those sources and yes. those websites because I don't think they're as reasonable. And maybe in this case they are. <laughs> <laughs> and now we turn to Christina. Can science prove rap is the most important music since 1960? Wouldn't that be amazing? Now, being on TRC means constantly researching and bookmarking potential topics, as you guys know. And I've surprisingly been sitting on this one for a while, considering I'm such a music fan. Darren, I know you like music segments, but how about a music meets evolutionary biology related oh, segment? Oh, boy! <laughs> now, a headline from a 2015 CNN article reads, Study. Hip hop is more important than the Beatles. <gasps> I can hear the protests from listeners now, and I totally get it. It's a pretty sassy statement. Now, the headline is misleading, but still, what kind of quote unquote study can possibly conclude a musical genre is more important than one of the undeniably most influential artists in music history using scientific rigor? In truth, I think this is the reason why I may have put off covering this until I could really dig into it. I figured it may be a bit controversial, which always makes for interesting jibber-jabber between us, right? So I've been a Beatles fan since I was a kid, thanks to my dad, who instilled a love of music in me. And he had an extensive vinyl collection I could pilfer from. But if I had to name my favorite genre of music the last few years, it would be hip-hop. Now, I'm also a big fan of facts and evidence, so I was really interested to see how this study was conducted, especially after reading the first couple of lines of the article. Quote, Forget the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The most important development in pop music in the past half century is hip hop. That's not an opinion. It's fact. Backed up by hard data, says a team of researchers from two London universities. End quote. Indeed, there is a comprehensive study published in the journal Royal Society Open Science, which is a peer-reviewed, open-access scientific journal, all the words we like, published by the Royal Society. It covers all scientific fields and publishes scientifically sound articles, leaving any judgment of impact to the reader. Now, says Armand Leroy, a professor of evolutionary biology at Imperial College London and one of the study's authors, we had a sense that lots of people have opinions about popular music, but nobody has any objective evidence. Okay, so how did they go about collecting objective evidence? 
Now, Adam, you talked about music fingerprints on episode 546 a couple weeks ago in a segment about who's tracking our browser history, and you mentioned Shazam. Now, similar to the app Shazam, the researchers from Queen Mary University of London and Imperial College London analyzed more than 17,000 songs using music recognition technology. So basically, they used algorithms and computer analysis. 86% of the songs appeared on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart between 1960 and and 2010. I cross-reference a lot of different coverage, which I link to in the show notes, including the actual detailed study, but I'm drawing from CNN's synopsis here. The researchers took 30-second clips of each track, broke them down into various topics. The study goes into great detail about the evolution of each topic, by the way, which I found really interesting, but obviously not a lot of time to get into. In general, the topics cover characteristics of music like chords, harmony, and timbers. So a couple of examples related to harmony are songs with major chords, no changes, and dominant seventh chords. And relating to timber, songs with female voice, melodic vocal, and guitar, loud, energetic. Should I unpack those two terms a little bit? I know those words, but I don't know what they mean. (laughs) I'm with Darren. (laughs) So harmony refers to simultaneous notes being played from any given chord. Timber is the tonal quality of music, right? The je ne sais quoi that that helps you distinguish a piano from a guitar. They could be playing the same note, they could be playing at the same yes. velocity, but you can uh-huh. tell the difference. Okay. It's what makes a particular musical sound differ from another. Mm-hmm. So it gets down to the minutia in this study, but for the sake of time, let's power through. Now the researchers teamed up with online music site Last FM, which has around fifty million users. Now, time out for a sec. Remember when Pat did that great segment on the most relaxing song mm-hmm. ever in episode two ninety seven? We learned that Unilever was foot in the bill for the dubious research, using it to help promote spa products. <laughs> it's worth noting a few things. When I saw Last FM cited, I thought Hmm, I better double check who's funding this research. Phew, it was great to read that all, even the extensive data from this research is completely available and they provide a link to the repository. As far as funding, author Matthias Mock is cited as being supported with a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellowship, but there are absolutely no conflicts of interest with this study. So moving on. Teaming up with Last FM, they could study how their topics fit into different genres, different styles, popularity over time, etc. Leroy told Inquirer.net, which isn't like the National Enquirer, it's a legit English language newspaper in the Philippines. I just thought that I should clarify that. Actually, for the most part, unsurprisingly, the songs of one year are usually pretty much like the songs of the next year. But there are some times when that distance, that difference becomes bigger, and you have a bunch of years suddenly all sorts of things are changing. And those are the years around which we identify the revolutions. Three notable such incidents occurred in 1964, 1983, and 1991, with 91 being the largest by far. So these are years where music evolve the most during the time frame of this study. Says Leroy in BBC News, quote, This is so prominent in our analysis, he's talking about 91, because we looked at harmony and rap and hip hop don't use a lot of harmony. The emphasis is on speech sounds and rhythm. This was a real revolution. Suddenly it was possible that you had a pop song without harmony. Now here's a bullet point list of some of the more interesting findings as listed in the CNN article. The rise of rap music and related genres appears to be the single most important event that has shaped the musical structure of the American charts in the period the research covered. Despite talk of a British invasion, bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones didn't set off the revolution in American music in 1964, but they did benefit from it and fanned its flames. Although many people complain that pop music has gotten more and more samey, Diversity actually increased in the 80s and 90s as hip-hop emerged and flourished. The researchers said they found no evidence for the progressive homogenization of music in the charts. However, they do note the low point for variety was in the early 1980s when genres like new wave, disco, and hard rock dominated. So here's a quote from the study's conclusion. Our findings provide a quantitative picture of the evolution of popular music in the USA over the course of 50 years. As such, they form the basis for the scientific study of musical change. 
Those who wish to make claims about how and when popular music changed can no longer appeal to anecdote, connoisseurship, and theory unadorned by data. Woo! Now, Leroy says he expects their study, The Evolution of Popular Music, USA 1960 to 2010, to be the first of many in an emerging field examining the evolution of different cultures through data. So he's talking paintings, like movies, TV. The authors conclude by discussing how their study points the way to a quantitative science of cultural change. Quote, We anticipate that the study of cultural trends based upon such data sets will soon constrain and inspire theories about the evolution of culture, just as the fossil record has for the evolution of life. Okay, I would love to hear your thoughts. But before I throw it to you guys, I want to mention a couple of things. They do talk about the study's limitations in the conclusion. An example would be compiling a database of several million songs for a complete picture. But I mean, that's not really feasible. That would be a huge undertaking. And remember, 86% of those songs made up the Hot 100. And in my experience, those are usually tracks or artists that have a big impact on trends, fashion, vernacular, all the kinds of things that fuel the type of music revolutions we're talking about. They do mention that they are, quote, interested in extending the temporal range of our sample to at least the 1940s, if only to see whether 1955 was, as many have claimed, the birth of rock and roll, which I thought was pretty fascinating. But anyways, what do you guys think? I think it's super interesting. I love when when people try to break something down and really empirically measure it. Um, You know, some ways you can do that is just like kind of asking people or looking at charts and things like that. But it sounds like they really looked at the music. And I think that's really interesting. Thinking about it, I think those numbers kind of make sense. So 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 the study seems to um, make sense to me. I'm wondering if there are other factors that could be an issue. For example, technology. 91 is a little early maybe for computer technology to have kind of taken over in the music scene. But I I wonder if uh, technology may have been a reason for which the sound changed a lot um, at a certain time or or, or gave rise to more variety, you know, as people are able to uh, use loops and things like that. Mm -hmm, um, Absolutely. Whereas it might have been more manual earlier, you know, and then when kind of disco came along, people started doing stuff with records and stuff uh, instead of just playing the same thing again and again. And, And now it's just, you know, people are taking samples and overlaying them and doing all sorts of stuff. That said, 91 seems a little early for that, but I'm not really a music guy. I don't know when that that kind of stuff might have happened. I think it's interesting to think about what the word important means, first of all. Uh, As you said, these people who are hitting the tops of the Billboard charts tend to influence the culture in various ways, but all of those criteria could be broken down further and whether people actually think they're important or not. Secondly, in terms of population, I believe there's far more music being created so there's far more listeners, which you could then say is more important because more people are being influenced. But then in a per capita sense, you may have to do some population balancing <laughs> in terms of what was happening in 1960 with much fewer people. And as such, that music might have been more important in certain ways back then. Or alternatively, it would be easier because there's just less options available. Yeah, like you, 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 you know, at a certain time, you can only hear what's on the radio. Uh, whereas, you know, now with the internet, you can... Anyone can can put something right. out there, right? Like Game of Thrones is so important because it's a huge cultural following. <laughs> but when there were two or three stations you could watch, 50 million people watched this thing that was on at 8 p.m. because yeah. there was nothing else to watch. Yeah. Yeah, your percentage of the share was uh, was mm-hmm. higher. And, and I agree with what you're saying about important. And, and I think maybe the term influential makes more sense in what they're talking about. Here. Good one. Yeah. And then, and it, but, but, but still, there's a bunch of caveats you can put on that, right? I think that someone made a valid point up front when you're talking about comparing a genre to a band Uh. and the Beatles were important in rock and roll, but they were not responsible for rock and roll. So then you have hip hop, which is very important. Like the, don't get me wrong, but you're taking this entire genre. So like were the Beatles more influential in rock and roll or were the Rolling Stones or was Chuck Berry or was like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but they're talking about years specifically and certain movements too. But here's an interesting stat for you guys for the first time ever R and B slash hip hop has surpassed rock to become the biggest music genre in the U.S. in terms of total consumption, according to Nielsen Music's 2017 year-end report. That was in USA Today. (laughs) 
Adam, energy costs versus waste. What does that mean? Great question. Early last year, I did a segment on plastic, disposable versus reusable bags, which also discussed the high energy costs of paper and cloth bags. We recently got an email about this topic, which I wanted to read and give some thoughts on. Listener Daniel writes, Hi, TRC. Love this show. In your piece on plastic bags, you made the same mistake all too many people make. Although you did give a brief mention of the immortality of plastic, you failed to consider the consequences of plastic in the environment. A certain percentage of plastic bags will fail to make it to a landfill, and some of those will wind up in the ocean, especially in coastal regions and islands. Plastic bags are deadly to turtles and other sea life. How many grams of CR2 are worth the life of a sea turtle? I really like turtles. They are so cool. And they are beautiful. It's always a treat to see one while snorkeling or paddling an outrigger canoe off the coast of Maui. We are destroying the world with our carbon emissions, but filling the oceans with turtle killers hardly seems like the answer. Maybe the question should not be plastic versus cloth versus paper. Maybe it should be, where should we be getting the energy to make paper and plastic and cloth? Maybe the question should be putting a thousand dollar per ton, 743 US dollar tax on CO2 emissions to encourage the switch to renewable energy. Following this, Daniel and I had a bit of a back and forth, which included some thoughts on nuclear power, which are probably best served on their own segment. So much to say, I, I agree with the general sentiment here. Uh, and in the time following my segment on this, I had similar thoughts. First, I'll touch on the numbers in my segment that I previously did for a reference for where we were coming from here. Uh, the study I had talked about was done in Quebec uh, and widely covered in the Quebec media, but not so much in English Canada or elsewhere in the world, which is why I wanted to bring attention to it. Study measured the impacts on human health quality of ecosystem and the use of fossil fuels. For single-use paper versus plastic, a single-use paper bag was worse by a factor of 20 to 28 times when it came to human health, 17 to 24 times when it came to the impact on the ecosystem, and 4 to 6 times for the fossil fuel resources used to make it. For reusable bags, there are different types, and, and these compared to uh, single-use plastic bags. So there's weaved polypropylene, which was 73 to 98 times worse for human health, 46 to 61 times worse for the ecosystem, and 16 to 21 times worse for fossil fuels. And then there's non-weaved polypropylene, which was a bit better, being 35 to 59 times worse for whom human health, 22 to 37 times worse for the ecosystem and 11 to 18 times more fossil fuel. So the shocker of the segment was reusable cotton bags. 2,954 to 3,657 times worse for human health, 702 to 870 times worse for the ecosystem and 100 to 124 times more used fossil fuels. So much to say, the big shock of this study and therefore what was highlighted in the report and uh, it was the highlight of my segment also is the simple fact that these seemingly more environmental options um, are on some metrics a lot worse, right? So you're talking paper, cotton, things that dispose of easily. There's a flip side to it. It's the high energy cost. Now I certainly mentioned but did not dwell upon the fact that the worse options, those being paper, cloth, and polypropylene reusable bags fare much better when it comes to waste. But how can we compare those two? Now, certainly waste needs to be considered, but how can it be weighed against fossil fuels, which ultimately results in carbon gas emissions and contributes to global warming? So certainly one could do the math, but I wouldn't be able to just do this math on my own. In the study that I covered, they mentioned the impact to the ecosystem and human health um, and the energy costs. Therefore, the impact was via things like global warming. And this seems to be what tipped the scales, giving more favorable ratings for some things, which would last much longer as litter, but maybe had a higher cost to produce. So I think it was important to point out the energy cost because that's the angle most people don't necessarily think about. I get the sense that people already think that paper is better because it can biodegrade. It's a better single-use product. So highlighting how there are other factors I think is important, even if the default assumption that people will often go to may still have some value. It's not to say that the thing they're thinking is necessarily completely wrong. All this said, I did give more thought to it after my segment and had more nuanced thoughts on it. For sure, a single-use plastic bag, if it ends up littered or improperly disposed of, has a tremendous lasting impact because it, it can take a 100 to a 1,000 years to break down, Okay. So littering just one of those little grocery bags is a huge thing. Compared to their plastic counterparts, cotton or paper bags have almost no lasting impact when littered. So these are made of similar materials as other naturally decaying things in the countryside. So it's the same as leaves or sticks or whatever if they're just ending up in a forest. They'll just get worked over and just biodegrade. Now I mentioned in my segment on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, 
that a couple of months after my original segment, I traveled to Bermuda. It's an island nation in which you're never far from the coast. Um, as a reference, the coastline is 103 kilometers, that's 64 miles long, while the area is 53 square kilometers or 21 square miles. Pretty much you're never far from one coast or the other. It's also kind of long. So we got paper bags at the grocery store, which we traveled to by bus, and we had a one-year-old with us, so it was a little inconvenient getting back with it. And we asked um, a native about it, and he mentioned that there were no plastic bags on the island because of the risk to littering. Now, with my anti-paper bag segment fresh in my mind, my first thought was to consider that this was close-minded and this was wrong and it was actually worse for the environment. But after some reflection, it, it did make some sense. With the close proximity of every part of this country to the shore, even if a very small percentage of plastic bags ended up in the ocean, the impact to wildlife and litter on the beaches would be significant. So even considering the differing energy costs, I had to admit to myself that this policy certainly seemed wise and it was probably the better choice for the country. So still in my own hometown, I always opted for plastic if I didn't bring my reusable bags. The energy cost was lower. It always seemed to make sense. Later that year, I moved from Elmer, which is a suburb and part of Gatineau, to Chelsea, a more rural area, which includes Gatineau Park and the Gatineau Hills, which despite the name are not part of the amalgamated city of Gatineau. So my local grocery store, which I go to now, serves part of Chelsea, other rural areas, and in the summer, it gets a lot of um, traffic of people going towards their cottages because it's near some of Quebec's lakes. Now, I was never asked paper or plastic in either official language. It was always clear that paper is the only choice that I had. Now, I don't know if the owners put much thought into the energy cost versus litter or any of this, or if they simply went along with the seemingly environmental conscientious choice of paper. All said, I must admit that once again, it might make more sense in this particular store to only give paper as an option. Even if a small number of these bags ended up discarded as litter in Chelsea's countryside, in the Gatineau Park, or in some of Quebec's lakes, the impact to wildlife and general littering of the environment would be significantly less if it was paper, not plastic. Similarly, if it was cotton and not a reusable plastic bag. Now, a recent story which I heard about on CBC Music mentioned something similar. The story which I've seen articles on elsewhere argues that streaming music is worse for the environment than buying a CD or record if you listen to it enough times. I think that time was something like 22, 27 times. You got <laughs> what? Yeah. And this is why rap is devastating the economy and the global environment. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so I don't, I don't have all the numbers. I didn't do a deep dive into that. But basically, the idea was that the high energy cost of servers, routers, of getting that uh, information to your house, using the Wi-Fi to get it to your device, meant that there was a higher energy cost to have you listen to that music than if you re-listen to a CD or record enough times. As a Canadian, I know that our terrible cell phone plans don't allow many people to stream unlimited music outside of their homes. So it's a bit of a side issue. So it might not apply all that well in Canada because I think a lot of people are going to end up downloading that music that they like on their phones and listening to it. And that's going to be uh, have some much different numbers. But these articles are really talking about things from a carbon emissions perspective. And there may be other concerns if your CD or vinyl record ends up disposed of improperly, or even if it's disposed of properly, taking up room in a landfill. So this isn't a problem if you never get rid of your music and you keep your vinyl records forever, like some people seem to be doing. Now, as I mentioned in my segment on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch on episode 508, plastic in the ocean is certainly a huge problem, but not all plastic will end up in the ocean. The listener who wrote in lives in Maui, so plastic there is a bigger concern than it might be in Ottawa, which is on a river, but not near the coast on the ocean. I recently had a chat with my stepson who was concerned our straws could kill sea turtles. I assured him that this was almost impossible, as even if the straw didn't make it into the garbage, or recycling, and then into a landfill or recycling plant, it's probably not going to somehow make its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Not to say that we shouldn't care about plastic if we're not by the ocean, but simply, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to kill a turtle. All of this to say that although I stand by my initial segment, the truth can be a bit more complicated. Where one lives, what waste management is like in their country or even in their own town can be factors in these kinds of issues. A big takeaway from the original segment on plastic bags was that it's difficult to do the best thing, but sometimes we can try to inform ourselves to make a slightly better choice, even if the best isn't always evident. Well, I'm sorry to potentially further complicate issues by suggesting that there may even more factors at play, but litter really does need to be something that you keep in the back of your mind. All this said, I think global warming is a huge problem. We've talked about it on the show before, and my feelings, as well as that of my fellow panelists, is that anthropogenic global warming is real. I think that this is the greatest existential threat of our time, though it's always hard to predict that, 
AI wildcard. <laughs> of course. Now, will we care as much about some plastic bags which aren't decaying fast enough in the forests when climate change is causing catastrophic changes in our ecosystems, possibly drowning some of these island nations? In hundreds of years, on the other hand, will climate change be a bigger concern than centuries of landfills, which will still be around from garbage produced as early as the 21st century? Who knows what the future might bring? There's no clear-cut answer to these kind of concerns, but so much to say, we can't really discount any of them. Reducing the amount of waste products you produce is always good, and it is also important to properly dispose of whatever waste you do produce, be it a plastic bag, vinyl record, or whatever it is. This means recycling if it's an option, or just disposing of it in the trash so that it ends up in a proper landfill. One problem I'm starting to notice is that sometimes items that end up at the curb for garbage or recycling pickup will fall out of the bin either before, during, or after pickup probably partially due to the wind, and then I need to pick that stuff up and throw it out again. It just goes to show that even if you're making every effort, things still can end up as unintended litter. So pick up after yourself and be careful where that trash ends up. Good stuff, Adam. I can't help but think it's interesting how people usually compartmentalize how they recycle and reduce energy in one domain and not think about in other domains. Meaning, yes. we'll buy all manner of junk and then try to use a recyclable bag. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't. It just <laughs> means, like, maybe uh, think about all the other junk you're buying. Like, people literally buy fake plastic trees and then they're worried about plastic in the forest. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. And thank you for joining us once again, listeners. I talked about Obama's presidential war on the press and a way of thinking about our filter bubbles and the media we consume. Christina explored whether science can prove rap is the most important music since 1960. And under some metrics, the answer is yes. And finally, Adam talked to us about energy costs versus waste. Uh, just try to do a better job not ruining the environment. <laughs> Until next time, think better, tack better. Peace out, keyboards. Stay classy, not smart assy, and go raps. We'll talk to you next week, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Wait, so wait, here's wait, what so I'd like wait, everyone wait. to focus on when we do the show is saying things that you want to be on the show. <laughs> right. That's what I was... Take that sentence again without a huge breath ahead of it. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't the work like this. Emphasis. You and me and <laughs> you and me are done professionally. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that quality show content where Pat comes off as a douche? The editor's not going to keep that. 